Thank you. It's really great to be here tonight with all of you. The year is 2014. As many of you know, about 50 years ago, Lyndon Johnson decided that we were going to uh, take on a war on poverty. Uh, that war on poverty was not just a US war on poverty, it was a global war on poverty. The World Bank was created, lots of institutions from USAID to other institutions were created, and today we still have a billion reasons to change our approach to energy access. So just the dimensions of the problem, roughly 40 years has been spent to give everyone access to electricity worldwide. The US accomplished this roughly 40 years ago in the United States, and we've been trying to get it to people worldwide. Today, the International Energy Agency says that in 2030, a billion people will still be without electricity. 15 to 30 percent of all of these people's incomes, which many of them are at less than three dollars a day, are spent on energy access today. So business as usual, which is extending the grid, figuring out how to build more central generation plants, isn't working. So what we need is new technology. So there's two flawed ideas. When you decide you want to solve a problem this big, you actually have to have some understanding of what it is that you're actually trying to solve. What's your meta-narrative? The meta-narrative for the last 40 years is the grid expansion narrative. Every single community, every single home is going to get connected to the grid. Many of you know in developing countries that's no longer happening. The second is the aid trap. That let's say we were going to actually figure out how to do this with solar. Let's say we were going to figure out how to do this with other technologies. How are we going to do that? You find that most countries say, we need to do that with free money. We've got to figure out how to get enough money raised and spent through NGOs throughout the world to give people access to free energy. But the reality of the situation is energy isn't free. It's not free to anyone. And when you look at the graph below there, what you find is, is that many countries around the world actually do subsidize these fuels. These countries on this list alone spend $80 billion a year in energy subsidies. And less than 15% of that money actually gets to poor people. The other 85% of the money is stolen along the pathway before it gets to its intended recipient. On the other side, the grid fallacy. The cost of grid power has soared. Why? Because copper prices are going through the roof. Because coal prices are going through the roof. It's not because the technologies that got us here in the United States are bad technologies. It's just that those technologies have gotten more expensive as it's been harder to find more and more deposits. Today, the world's poorest people spend 10% of all the money in the world for lighting and get one one thousandth of the light. Just think about that. What they're doing today is using kerosene, diesel, and candlelight. That candle is providing a small amount of light, but it costs exactly the same as your incandescent light bulb. In fact, it actually costs them 10 times more than your incandescent light bulb. And so when you multiply it all together, they're getting one one thousandth of the light for 10% of the global budget for lighting. How does technology play a role? Here's just one example. Solar panel prices have come down by over 90% in the last 25 years. LED have come down in price by over 90% in the last 20 years. Today, it's actually cheaper to give these people electricity using solar and LEDs than it is using the grid. It's actually cheaper to give these people solar and LEDs than the current, current subsidy regime. Even the international agency concedes today that universal energy access now depends on off-grid investments. That's a big change. That change only occurred in the last few years. 
just a few years ago, they were still saying that we cannot and we should not provide people with electricity unless it's through grid extensions. So how affordable is solar? The blue line shows what a poor person is intending to pay on energy today. That line goes up every year because they pay more every single year, and that's a cumulative chart. The red line and the green line is how much solar plus LEDs would cost them. You can see that it's less than a two-year payback. And in some cases, it's less than a one-year payback. So, so what's holding this whole innovation back? It's radical affordability. Radical affordability is that the low-income consumer can actually afford to pay for this themselves. If only they could pay for solar the same way they currently pay for kerosene, candles, batteries, and phone charging. And that way is using small, irregular, user-defined increments. Another way of saying that, they pay when they can. They pay when they can. We have to figure out how to be okay with they pay when they can. Today, we can be okay with that. Just one example. Today, 543 million people have cell phones with no place to charge them at home. You own a cell phone, and you actually don't know where you're going to charge them. So what do they do? They go to business owners who have diesel generators, and they go to them to charge their cell phone. They spend $10 billion a year in 5 to 20 cent increments to get their cell phone charged. It would cost only a billion dollars to actually solve the entire problem, right? These are basically putting in a kiosk, which is solar powered with a bunch of uh, charging stations off of it, just like you see at the airport. And it would create $5 billion of additional profit to the telecom operators. Why? Because today it's so expensive to charge their phone, these people keep their phone off all the time. They keep it off until they really need it to check farm prices or whatever it is that they need to check, and then they turn it off again. If they actually had charged phones, people would actually use them, and you'd get more ARPU, what they call average revenue per user, uh, for the mobile phone industry. The economics work. So in summary, the, the solution basically to providing all of this is $100 billion. It costs about a dollar a week per person, and it saves them about $3 a week out of their budget. Sounds fantastic. And pay when, when you can exists already throughout um, the world through Simpa Networks, MCOPA, Econet Energy. These are companies that provide mobile payment mechanisms. These are companies that provide you with other ways to pay, pay when you can. And the private sector gets a 40% return under these numbers. A 40% return on investment. The same return on investment that they made providing all of these folks with access to mobile phones. And the money is available. When you think about where we're spending subsidy money already, $80 billion a year, of which 85% of that money is adulterated through the supply chain and never gets to the poor. That money is already there. $10 billion a year, the number on the right, is what we need to actually solve this problem. Pretty amazing. So let's figure out six principles here for success. One, set a goal, 2025. In 10 years, we have the technology and the money and the resource, and more importantly, the profit motivation to solve this problem. Two, avoid the grid fallacy, the notion that we should just wait until the grid gets to these people. Three, avoid the aid trap. These people do not need something for free. What they need is something that actually saves them $3 a week, but only costs them a dollar a week. 
they're willing to pay for really good service. Four, the government absolutely has a role. The government's already spending $80 billion a year in subsidies, so the government has a role to play in figuring out how they can help through standards, through making sure that there are best practices, through making sure that there's actually licensing requirements, to making sure that people are actually getting what they're promised. Five, use established distribution. In the example that I gave, the mobile phone operator should actually distribute that solution because it's in their own best financial interest to make sure that people's cell phones are charged. And six, don't pick winners and losers. There is no one solution. Whether it's solar, small hydro, small wind, whether it's small fuel cells, there's all sorts of technologies that are gonna come to play to solve this problem. But don't choose winners and losers, just make sure that you actually have a high standard that you're setting for everyone. This problem is a persistent one. We've spent over 40 years working on this problem. It hasn't worked. Figuring out how to use big money, big government, and big industry to solve this problem hasn't worked. Today, what we need are small entrepreneurs with local solutions, with neighborhood entrepreneurs that are trying to figure out how to help the folks in their neighborhood to solve this problem. And more importantly, solving this problem represents the largest wealth creation opportunity on the planet. Thank you very much.